But it'd be interesting to know that there is a church, unfortunately, that I had an experience with, where they said that they were out to make disciples. But they did not want to preach the truth that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. They didn't want to say the word sin. They didn't want to say the word repent. And they said, that's not our mission for the church. It's not our mission to make people feel uncomfortable. But rather, we want everybody in the community to come. We want to outreach. They changed the meaning of outreach to bring in all these unbelievers. And instead of pre preaching the truth and God and his word, they wanted to preach Christian aerobics. They wanted to preach uh, Christian financial budgeting. They wanted to preach... Uh, all these things that the world does and just slap the word Christian on it. But they didn't want to talk about sin. They didn't want to talk about growing up in God, maturing in Him, casting off the flesh, examining yourself. And then when you do those things, the good news is, besides that Jesus died on the cross, is that if we continue in Him, no matter what the world brings to us or what tribulations come about, that we have peace, joy, and Jesus Christ who will safeguard our souls and is giving us an inheritance in heaven. But they don't do that. If you tell and you go out and make converts and you deny or ignore, ignore the command to tell them that they have sinned and that they need to repent and ask for God's forgiveness, you're making a false convert. If you're telling people that, you know, we don't, we're not going to have, uh, we're not going to teach people how to witness and share their faith or to understand the whole big picture of how man sinned, we have sinned, we all fall short of the glory of God, we're all going to hell because we're guilty, and that the only way is that Jesus came and died for the sins of the world. And that it's like when you presented yourself and you stand before a judge because you committed crimes, you're going to go to prison, guaranteed. There's, you're guilty. There's no way out. You're going to prison. But that Jesus stepped up, took your punishment, paid your fine when you didn't deserve it. But you have to be convicted in your heart by the Holy Spirit that you grieved God and that you repent, you fall on your face. And you say, God, I'm sorry. I, in tears and weeping and just throwing yourself at his mercy and asking for his forgiveness because it grieves you so much that you sinned against him. And then you've counted the cost. And am I going to lay down everything in my life, all the sinful desires to lay that down? I know the trials will be hard, but to follow after God and his word, to be set apart, to not be of the world. And few do that. That's the message we're supposed to preach. But there's two churches in America and probably around the rest of the world that ignore and will not do that. So if you don't preach those things and you just preach saying, hey, it's kind of like a Joel Osteen, you can have your best life now. You know, Robert Schuller, hey, just think good thoughts and bring great principles and, you know, there's no truth, there's no repentance, there's no holding fast to the truth, testing everything against God's word. And to the point of where we actually come against those who bring in false teaching, you're making a false convert. That's when Jesus told the Pharisees, they had all the right words, they, had, they dressed up, they played the part, but inside their hearts they were far from God. That's why Jesus said, you go to make a convert, but you make him twice as worse as you are. When it comes to convincing people, we are not to convince people to come into the church and say, hey, so we're the same. Just come on and just be with us. Christians are fun. No. Christians have joy. And yeah, we do some fun things, but the thing that sets us apart is the truth of God and His Word. The thing that sets us apart is the sin that we no longer seek after, but God and His Word, so we mature in Him. To draw closer to Him, to have that relationship with Him. Whew. Wow. 
there's a lot going on here with God and His Word. And when it talks about maturity and leadership and the biblical qualifications. And now I hope you can see why it's so important. Why we need to follow those qualifications. Why we need to follow God and His Word. Why we need to be mature and obedient. Because if you're not, you're like a... It's like when you're a little boy, about seven years old, eight years old, and you want to play soldier, you want to be a soldier. That's a noble thing. But you dress up in the clothes, you carry a gun around, you got the helmet on, but you don't have the maturity to do battle with the enemy. That's why we need to be mature. We need to be disciplined. We need to go through lots of trials. We need to go through the training that is required so that we can be on the lookout for false teachers, that we can be on the lookout for sin, that we can be on the lookout for anything that presents itself against God and His Word. To safeguard what? His children. Jesus said in a scripture, He said that those if you cause a little one to stumble... If you teach something to a little one, his children, to have them do wrong and to sin, that a millstone should be tied around your neck and you should be thrown into the sea. The Bible also says that those who teach are held to a higher standard. In other words, we're held to a higher, there will be more punishment for us if we go into false teaching, give false prophecies because of the terrible impact it will have on the children. Think of it. If you have a child and you abuse that child, you neglect that child, your children will be taken away and you'll be thrown in prison. How much more do you think God is going to look after his children? And how much more he's going to hold his teachers accountable to his word when it comes to his children and their eternal souls. Anyway, it's a hard message. And it's hard to find those who are mature in the Lord anymore. Because we don't look at the qualifications. We don't follow them. And if you don't follow them in your own lives, how can you expect somebody else to pick somebody else, somebody who's mature. It's kind of like you got a bunch of little kids running around trying to pick out who's going to be boss. And while our faith in Christ is supposed to be childlike, it's supposed to, we're supposed to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. That we're supposed to watch, to be that watchman on the wall, to look out for the enemy. Because we are responsible to those in our charge. All right, that's it. Maturity, biblical leadership in the Bible and its qualifications. We need to be in the truth. We need to seek God, know Him, walk in His Word, be obedient. It's all there. He's given us everything for life. It's just whether you, you count the cost and you're willing to be obedient. So anyway, take care. God bless. Peace.